Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Wrench Turners podcast, a show that's dedicated to the life, well-being, and productivity of mechanics everywhere. I am your host, Mr. Joshua Taylor, founder of Wrench Turners Online, and today we have another episode as part of our recruitment series. We have a gentleman that has been around automotive recruitment for almost 20 years, maybe even tw- more than 20 years, if if you have to listen to LinkedIn and go, oh, that's 19.1 years, I just say 20 years, it's 20 years. He's owned and operated his recruiting business, Automax Recruiting. This is Joe Lockard. Joe, thank you very much for taking the time and spending it with us today. Yeah, Josh, thanks for having me. I know uh, it's been tough for us to connect here. We're both very busy people, but I'm I'm happy to finally be here and uh, excited to dig in a little bit. Uh, I, uh, our good friend Ted Ng has got us connected, and I hear you're doing some some really awesome stuff out there. And providing value for for all the the automotive technicians in uh, both Canada and America. So happy to be here. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, we're, now I'm just trying to remember, were we on the same panel? We were on a panel or series of, no, we were on a series of panels last year, I think. I think your panel was right after mine. We we're talking okay. about technicians and, and so on. So that's, yeah, it's cool. time flies. Time flies. Yeah, it's, well, yeah. it's funny because, yeah, we do that panel. I do, you know, Ted has dubbed us the, the Tech Ventures on the Fixed Ops Roundtable. And I had to go back and look for how long I've been doing it. We do them every quarter. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's been probably over two years, two and a half years that I've been doing those with Ted. And a lot of fun, man. I love talking about this stuff. You know, we do. We provide recruiting, obviously, both on variable and, and fixed ops side. But um, the conversation on the fixed side tends to be a little more casual fun i don't mm-hmm. know what the word i'm looking for is here but <laughs> we have we have fun as a group and um uh, i'm i'm always willing to to sit down and exchange ideas awesome awesome so let let's let's go back to the beginning as it were yeah. um you've been doing this a long time so what is it that got you into recruiting for yeah. automotive I have no idea. I don't. I don't know what happened. I don't know how I got here. Like you said, time flies, right? It's it's twenty years later. I got kids, and you know things happen. So, I went to uh, I went to college and studied um, finance and economics, and I, you know I, I did a lot of labor economic studies. So I you know ran a lot of regression analysis and and you know spent a lot of time digging through the the Bureau of Labor Statistics and things like that. Actually, my senior thesis was on uh, salary discrimination amongst Major League Baseball pitchers. So I was way on the numbers side of things. I got out, I you know, big plans. I was going to go work for the Federal Reserve Branch in, in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm originally from um, Northeast Ohio. And my father started this company. Oh, geez, we're, we'll be 28 years in November. And, you know, I had spent just, just, you know, from him spending time prior to that, he had done you know, everything you could possibly do in a car dealership. Um, so I, I, I'd been around car dealerships, you know, when I was younger and, and certainly grabbed some secondhand in, information from him. And I knew enough to know that I didn't want to go work inside of a car dealership, right? Like I, I saw the passion from him, but you, you see both sides of it. You see the long hours, you see come a, kind of some of the stress, but with him creating a, an outlet to still participate in the automotive industry, find the things that you love about the automotive industry, find a way to help people without having to do the other side of it and, and work the 60 hours because it's not very conducive to to raising a family, which I knew was something I wanted to do. He kind of created that outlet. So anyway, I, I get done with college and things happen and, you know, my dad says, hey, why don't you come out here? And, and he was... Um, running the company from New Jersey at the time. And, you know, most people that grow up in Ohio, you don't stick around Ohio, right? It's it's a place to call home and, and you get the heck out of there when you're done with school or whatever it may be that you're doing. So I headed out and had no big plans. I certainly didn't think this is what I would be doing with my entire life. Um, meet a girl, you know, fall in love, get married, have more bills. And it the, the momentum picks up. And, and one thing that I found out pretty early about the automotive industry, despite some of the the things that I mentioned and the challenges, and and it it certainly, um, if you let it, it it can beat you down pretty good. It's a very addictive industry, and it's very unique. And once you kind of learn why it's unique, you learn the intricacies, and and you become part of that community, it pulls you in. And I just kind of fell in love with being able to to okay, I, I can be a part of this industry, but What's nice about recruiting is 
it is the ultimate people industry. And I know that's that's a cliche that gets thrown around a lot, but that's what we're doing is, you know, we're, we're selling people, we're finding people, we're, we're, you know, connecting them on with the clients and we're finding value for the candidate, we're finding value for the client and we're matching people together. You know, it's like a, a big uh, dating service for the automotive industry. So having, you know, being able to, to bring those two things together and kind of now, you know, as my dad has, has stepped down and, and I've taken over operation of the company and kind of make it something that that I envisioned it and put some of my values and, and bring, you know, some of the you know perspectives that I have not growing up in the automotive industry, not being a quote unquote car guy. Um, it's been a nice vehicle for me to, to kind of, you know, feel good about what I'm contributing and what Automax is contributing to the industry. Awesome. Yeah. So let, let's, let's go dive a little bit deeper here. Now it's been 20 years. Uh, you've had some, an interesting way in and, You've got you've had perspective to to give you clarification as to you know you want to be part of the automotive industry but not necessarily in the store. Yeah. So recruiting is obviously a, a way to do that. What was the first? Do you remember? Do you remember what was the first year of of recruiting like? Oh, yeah, it's, like? it's flashes, right? It's you know, and I don't know if I remember you know specifically. Hey, this was year one. This was year two. But I can tell you, um, it was it was confusing and a little scary at times in a, a, a bit of a culture shock for me. And you got to remember this is so we're going back to, you know, early 2000s. And I, I feel like things have changed significantly since then as far as the culture within dealerships. And we feel that culture. I mean, whatever's going on on the retail side, it's, it's happening to us also. So there was a, a lot of, um, you know, maybe conflict there first. You know, I... I was doing a lot of cold calling to prospective clients. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to newspapers, if anyone remembers newspapers. I mean, that was the majority. I shouldn't say the majority. It's about 50-50 between, you know, Monster Career Builder and newspapers as far as where we were finding our candidates way back then. So I was negotiating rates to, to run big display ads in newspapers. But, you know... I've, I've always said, if you can sell to a, a dealership GM, you can sell to anybody. So just having to learn on the fly, not just learn the industry and and being able to talk to that type of, of individual and get them to see the value in what we do. Um, but, you know, just just selling, period, which is what we do, right? I mean, we're like I said, we're selling our service and then selling. This is this is the candidate. This is the right person for the job. Um it, there were many times during that first year where I said, this isn't for me. I, I have no interest in doing this. And like I said, I'll be perfectly honest. I was ready to move on after about two years. And and then I met my wife and I ended up staying because I was ready to get out of Jersey. I'm like, hey, thanks, Dad, for the opportunity. I'm going to go do some other things that you know are, are more in line with what I had envisioned for my future. Um, but but challenging. If I had one word to use, it, I'd, I'd say challenging. It's It's a unique industry. And yeah, there's there's a lot to pull you in, and there's certainly money to be made, but it's it's not for the faint of heart. Gotcha, gotcha. What would you say? What would you say the biggest learning that you had in that first year was? <laughs> you, know, you say it was challenging, and there's lots of things, and you were you know I'm, a year I'm to still... two years in, and you are ready yeah. to, to bounce, but you stayed in it. What was the, what was the thing that you learned? Uh, what was the most important thing that you probably learned in that first time? Yeah, and I'm still learning it, and it's. Um... Shut up and stay calm, I, I think, is the main thing, right? I, I don't take it personal. You know what? If I had to put like a, a motto on it, it's don't take it personal, you know, because we don't function like a lot of other industries and you will hear things or have things said to you. You know, I, the one parallel industry that I hear a lot, my wife spent a lot of time in the restaurant industry um, in college and big parallels to the restaurant industry where you can spend the entire day back in the, or night back in the kitchen. Everyone's screaming at each other. There's things that need fixed on the fly. It's go, go, go. And at the end of the night, everyone's, you know, having a beer and, and hugging each other. Right. And it's all working towards a common goal. And I really, you know, didn't understand that, Hey, it's, it's just a little rough around the edges. You know, there's, there's going to be some conflict. You're not going to, you know, be treated with white gloves and you're, you're probably going to have to face a little bit of rejection. So I really had to just calm down. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, 
I'm, I'm Italian on my mom's side. I'm Scottish on my dad's side. I, I, I had a temper, right? And I'm coming out of college. I got my degree. I know everything, right? So just, just being humble and not taking things personally was huge for me. And, and really, uh, you know, I'd say that's really only taken root here in the past five to six years. And I've done a lot of personal growth stuff and worked on myself. And of course, you know, being married and, and having three kids, you have no choice but to be patient and, and to just listen and take your time before you formulate a response. And that was huge for me to not be so ready to just react. And it was just let it sink in, take your time, understand that that person on the other side is going through their own challenges. And whether, again, it's it's on the client side, the, the chaos that goes in within a dealership and, and back in the service department, these people have their hands full nonstop all day long, whether it's an advisor, a manager, a lot porter, a technician, there's a lot on their plates. They're busy people. Or if it's on the candidate side and you're talking about somebody who's facing a ton of uncertainty and potentially looking to make a change in their career, you're again, you're going to face some challenging conversations and you, you got to make sure that you're keeping yourself calm in the middle of that conversation. Gotcha. Yeah, this um, I would say one of the things that I need to learn the most is patience. Um, that's that's one of the biggest things to have a conversation. Do you have kids? Boring. Yeah, I got a ten year old. Yeah, I mean, it's... He, he 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 he. Let me say this politely. <laughs> he pulls every single strand and fiber of my patience. Yeah, he tugs on them. Some days he rips on them. And it takes every fiber of my being to be patient for my son. It takes yeah. every fiber of my being because he just pushes every single button. I know. Now, that said, so does my wife. And I'm fairly confident that I push both of their buttons too. Of course. But yeah. th the biggest thing that, that I've learned over the time is the more patient I can be, the better everything becomes. Right. It's just – just the way it is right now the 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 caveat there and and i've had this conversation with people i i respect and and mentor and coach and what have you in therapy as well is that the other side of patience is being is not this, the I, I don't know if too patient is the the right way to phrase it but there's a line in the sand where i'm interested in yeah it, right you, you you can't wait too long you can't be too patient you have to you have to take action to some degree. Now right. that action does also need to be appropriate, but don't wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and do nothing. Right. Well, and you also, and this is something I talked to my wife about, cause I, I do see this. I feel like it's a lot more prevalent in, um, in, in the female world and amongst moms and wives. If you give someone, if you just give and give and give to someone, some people will just keep taking and taking and taking. And I don't, I mean, taking from an emotional standpoint. So you can't let someone just constantly dump on you, dump on you, dump on you. Cause you got your own stuff going on. Like you said, everyone's got their, their problems. Everyone's got their things. You, you know, I, I drive my kids crazy. Same way they drive me crazy. Absolutely. So yes, create a space for your child, for your client, for the candidate to be heard, but then provide value, give back and, and make sure this doesn't turn into just a vent session. You know, you, you can't, exactly. you can't always be the therapist. You sometimes, you know, it's good. Sometimes people do just need to be heard, but at the end of the day, like you said, you do have to think of it. Okay. How can I provide value? What are they really looking for? What do they need from me and, and do your best to provide what it is they're actually looking for in that situation? Awesome. That's that listen to understand, not to respond exactly. kind of kind of deal. Yeah. Awesome. I'm still working on that one. I, that's a big one in marriage, right? I mean, it's it, so I have, I have all daughters. I mean, I my entire life is female dominated. Our our staff is predominantly female. So you would think I would eventually get to the point that I understand that the most of the time when a woman's talking to you, they don't want you to fix anything. You don't have to jump right in with the solution. It's like a lot of times they're just they're just getting it out and they want you like you said to understand what they have going on and that's been a nice one for me to carry over to any of my relationships you know like you said candidate client wise um listening to to be heard instead of or listening to understand instead of trying to to fix the problem immediately awesome yeah I, it's tough especially when you know uh with people that you trust 
and the people that you expect a lot from. And it's not the expectation that they do a lot for you. It's just you have high expectations sure. for them, especially spouses. Um, making sure that when your your guards down and their guards down that it's not okay to just vent filter with and, and just dump all of your your bits and pieces on them as it were yeah um because once that filters off you can be you can be quite harmful yeah and the the other side of that as well and I try to look at both sides is if you're if you don't have someone that you can do that with, that's also a problem. Absolutely. Now, it doesn't have to be a spouse. Right. Like in, in the right context, with the right circumstances, with the right communication, your spouse can do that. But in reality, it really should be a professional. Absolutely. Therapy you should is... be involved, but it's the, not their responsibility to fix your no. stuff. It's, it's not their no. job. So I, I appreciate that. So let's talk into a, a little bit deeper here. You've been doing this for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And... You've seen a lot of people. You've put a. Uh, you, you've met a lot of dealers, a lot of GMs, a lot of candidates across sales, service, the works. Yeah. So, through that time, what what are the transitions? What have the transitions that you've seen been across, say, the last, well, say, three or four different sections? So, you know, like the first five years, next yeah. five, like as things kind of progress, because that's kind of like how car models go, right? Every five to seven years is like yeah. a full. Full yeah, reset agree. and redesign. What what are the, maybe the three or four things that you have seen as the major changes in in the last twenty years? Sure, and and I kind of hit on it already. Um, you know our our origins. You know it's 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 not the the nicest sounding term, but it really was a cattle call back in the day when we first started this, and it was just get the job opportunity as visible, make it look as nice as flashy as possible, get it in a, a newspaper, get it on on whoever the major job boards were at the time, and you're going to have a bunch of people coming at you. You know, everybody wants to work, everybody needs a job. So no matter what the position was, um, we, we saw pretty adequate response. And then, you know, our value was more in the screening process and how we were filtering out the, the right individuals. Um, you know, you flash forward if you want to take the next five years and and really, print was done. I mean, it happened quick. I, I, I'm amazed thinking, reflecting back on it, on the amount of money that our clients were spending on newspaper ads for, for our recruiting campaigns, the effectiveness, and then just overnight, practically. Uh, and I think 08, 09, I think the recession hit, it, it had a large impact on that as well. Obviously, people are looking to for efficiency, right? Let's Let's get the message in front of as many people as possible. And then of course you had digital advertising, um, social media, and, and just how that took off again in the past 15 years. It, it feels like it's always been here with us, but it really hasn't been that long. So that second segment was all digital, right? And, and this, you're just starting with social media. We really weren't using social media to, to find candidates or frankly, to, to market who we are as a company either. Um, to bring those two people together, obviously, because it's great to have the candidates. It's great to ha have the clients, but you got to have both. If you only have one or the other, you're not connecting people. So that second segment was hard, hard, hard um, job board advertising, but still largely, if you won't call it reactive to where we knew if if we made it, you know, this visible, spent this amount of money got it in front of this many people, it was going to trickle down to, we're going to have a hundred candidates. Okay. 50 of those are, are real. 25 of those are qualified, you know, dealer selects 10 of those and everyone's happy. Flash forward, you know, to where we're at right now. And you could call it kind of the, the, the COVID culture. And I think it was starting to happen a little bit before. I think COVID was kind of a tipping point for it. Um, and, and you had the great resignation, whatever you want to call it. The majority of what we do anymore is proactive and yeah, we, we still use job boards and yeah, obviously, you know, with, with the way algorithms work and the things you can do to target specific groups of people, specific areas on social media, there's still a place for that. And we always want to, you know, keep the our, all of our opportunities visible. You never know when the right candidate's going to come along. But more often than not, and especially when we're talking about recruiting technicians, and especially when we're talking about veteran, high-level OEM certified technicians, we got to go find them and we got to start the conversation. So we've spent a lot of time over the past five years 
building up our database, you know, that's that's always easiest way for us to do it. Individuals that we've already had communication with that we have in the pipeline, they maybe they weren't a fit over here, but they might be a fit over here. But, you know, finding new resources and accessing those databases, filtering through those people, if we don't have a match for them now, making sure that we keep in touch with them, keep the communication open on the candidate side so that when we do have an opportunity with a, a new client or a, a client that, that we've worked with in the past that came back, that, you know, we can get the two of them together. And like I said, really is kind of like a, a, a dating site for, for technicians, for the automotive industry. So I think that's where we're at now. And I think that's, that's kind of where a lot of dealerships struggle with this is it's just a time, you know, factor. It's, it's not rocket science. We're not reinventing the wheel. I don't have a, a fancy app or a, a fancy, you know, widget that I can promote. It's, it takes a lot of time and it takes an insane amount of availability if you want to recruit high level technicians or any, you know, significantly experienced individual to come work in your dealership. And that's that's what we're doing these days. OK. And would you say that your time per client has doubled? Who at least <laughs> are we going back if we're going back to the beginning? It's, mm -hmm. it's almost infinite, right? I mean, the, the amount of time that we put into, you know, talk about it at the origins, you post a job, you, they respond, you reply with an email. Now it's like, you got to figure out how they want to communicate. I mean, they, it, I didn't even mention text messaging, right? I mean, there's there's times now where we might be working with a, a big time high level candidate and we might not even have a phone conversation. There's a lot of technicians that, that one, don't want to talk on the phone, don't have time to talk on the phone. And it's just easier for them to communicate via text message or via email. So finding the medium where someone wants to communicate, trying three, four, five times just to have that that base, that initial conversation and see if this is a good fit for both sides is is massively time consuming as opposed to before when, you know, if someone applies to a job, they're interested, you send an email, you schedule them, you come you confirm it and you're done. Um, so, I, you know, I'm thinking more like tenfold, you know, if, if it took, wow. uh, you know, two, three hours of, of manual labor to, to fill a position uh, 20 years ago, um, you know, I, I'd feel comfortable saying it's, it's 20, 30 hours. If we put, you know, two, three hours in a week on an individual job and it takes a month to fill that position, you know, you do the math on that, it's, it's, it's probably closer to tenfold. Wow. Okay. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Good to know. And my little pushback on that a little bit is if you have technicians that only want to communicate via text, <laughs> they're going to be a challenge to make sure that, that they're providing the, the full value to the store they're going to, because somebody who's not capable or not willing to talk on the phone is not going to be somebody who's going to be willing to and capable of talking on the phone to advisors or to customers or willing and capable of talking to a uh, service manager on feedback, sure. willing to like, these are these are some of the skills that I'm that I'm trying to instill in, into the the through coaching. Right? Absolutely, these people need to learn how to read, write, and speak. Yep. And as much as we are taught in school, we aren't talk, taught in school at all. The way we really need to be taught in school to be uh, professionals out in the world right. working, um, interacting we, with uh, human beings. <laughs> interacting with other human beings is important. And I realize that we have text messaging or messaging and messengers and there, we have hundreds of different options for messaging, but pick up the phone, talk to yeah. people, right? Get on a video call. It's very, 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 very easy to pick up the phone. Like Google is free. You, you ha Everybody can have a Google account and you can click the little button that says Google Meet and you can have a free video conference with somebody, anybody, anywhere in the world and right. meet the face that you're actually talking to and talk to them. Right. Like it's a great way. And this is one of the challenges through coaching. We're talking about interviewing and, you know, when they come to me, it's like, oh, I want to find a better place to work. This place sucks. Da, 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 da. It's like, well, a, you need to look in the mirror because that's the first place that, that we need to look to make sure that you are doing everything that you can be, the things that you can control to make sure that your environment is 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 not the variable, that it's you the variable. Remove all sure. of those that we possibly can and can control what we can control. And then we look at the other opportunities of the working environment. And then we look at the other opportunities. Maybe the work environment isn't what you need. Maybe you need a different working environment. Maybe the team, maybe the leader, maybe the store, maybe the brand, whatever the case may be. But let's look at you first. Yeah. But if you're not willing to talk with me, it means in all likelihood you're not willing to talk with anybody there. Yeah. And yeah. if you feel like you're in a toxic environment, 
but you're not willing to talk anybody, guess what? Yeah. More than likely, it's you. Spread the so, word, oh. Josh. You got to you got to get it get it out there. Keep talking to everybody. So, here's here's the problem. And it's funny. So, everything you're saying for us as a recruiter applies to every other position that we recruit for other than mm-hmm. automotive technician. We have to take all the rules and the standards and, you know, the basic stuff you learn how to interview for a job, job etiquette. You don't ask about income on an initial interview. And if we want to have some, you know, real conversations with high level technicians, we got to throw a lot of that stuff out the window. And our clients will understand that too. And yeah, I, I, all, you know, I have some clients that are like, hey, this is the standard. This is what I need from technicians. It's not just about a resume. It's not just about their certifications. Here's who they need to be as a human being. And, and they draw a line in the sand. But I can tell you right now, when you do draw that line in the sand, you're going to give up a little bit on the talent and the experience side of it because it's such a job seekers market right now, specifically just for automotive technicians that, yeah, we have to make concessions for techs that we would never make for a service manager, for a a sales manager, for a GM, you know, obviously there's going to be, Hey, these are the things we need to do to, to screen out and find out if you're right for this position. And then, like I said, the proactive nature of it, it's just the nature of how we have to find people because they're not going to come to us and they're a passive job seeker to where, hey, you came to me. You asked me if I was interested. I didn't come to you. So let's start here. It, like you said, though, obviously at the end of the day, it's got to result in, a, in not just a phone conversation and not just a Zoom. You got to sit down in front of that person and find out who they are as a human being and, and what's going on in here and in here and, and not just, you know, a piece of paper and, and certifications. Yeah, those. it's really important that the entire communication process is involved. Um, I can't, I just can't reinforce that enough. Yeah. Um, when, when I have technicians telling me like, Hey, you know, I just found this place and it was $5 more an hour and it sucks. And it's like, okay, let's, let's back the truck up a little bit. Um, you know, what did you do for due diligence? And it's, well, what's that? And it's like, well, did you check out the area? Did you check the store? Did you check the throughput? Did you check the reviews? Did you yeah. check their Facebook page? Other technicians, right. Let's, let's, did you, did you, you know, did you try and uh, find other technicians in some way? Oh no, they were out of state. We moved. It's like, okay, I, I understand that makes life a little bit difficult if it's, if it's a fair distance. I understand that. I understand that. Um, but what did you do? It's like, oh, well, you know, I checked out their website. It's like, all right. Awesome. What else did you check out? I checked out their website. It's like, and that's, and that's generally, you know, there are some folks out there that really do their due diligence, like Russell Wickham, my boy, Russell Wickham. He knows what to do. They'll do a fly through of the shop. They'll do a, uh, a, a the Google view of the dealership to see how big the dealership is, how big the wow. lot is. It's a lot well-maintained, right? You go into, into the Google reviews, look at all of the Google reviews, look for the stuff in service, see what this, uh, the people who are good and bad reviews are for service. Yeah. Like we kind of got a feel of what the service advisors are like, because they're not necessarily going to be talking about the technicians. Like we can go deep into this. If you do your due diligence, you're going to have a much better picture of the store right. that you're possibly well, looking for. And, and this is something that comes up, you know, in all that before you even get to an interview, but that stuff needs to be hashed out during an interview. And, and Marco Zwanenberg, who got us together, you know, he says all the time, and we've talked about this on our panel a lot, if you go to an interview and they won't even let you talk to another technician, walk in the back and, and meet and have conversations with the other technicians, there's a reason for that. I mean, there's no better recruiting tool than, yeah, come on back, hear it, don't don't take my word for it. Let's talk to the technicians and they'll let you know what's great about working here. I mean, that's the ultimate closing tool, but from the candidate side of it, you know, you're just going in blind if you're just taking it because it's five dollars more per hour and you haven't talked to any of the current employees and you don't know what actually goes on at this dealership. It's just luck of the draw at that point. Yeah. And, yeah, and there's, often, there's a reason they have to offer the extra five dollars. Right. I mean, if, if they're giving you if that's that's all they got, that's their closing tool is, well, I'll just give you five dollars more. I, I might treat you like crap, but I'm going to give you five dollars more, you know. Yeah, and some people that's a big deal because you know if you're 100 you know, percent efficient on your 100 percent time, that's an extra 10 G's a year. That's yeah, a big right. deal for a lot. Like that's a really, really big deal. Yeah, like, that's basically a car payment that you've just added on to the top, yeah. right? Or subtracted, as it were, if you've got a car payment that you're trying to pay for. Like it's a very 
then the five, I throw the five dollars out because that's the most common thing that's tell, said to me sure. in coaching. It's like they offered me five more dollars an hour. It's like okay, that's a pretty damn good carrot going from you know twenty five to thirty dollars an hour, or thirty to thirty five dollars an hour. It's a big carrot. Yeah. But are you gonna actually gonna make the extra five dollars more an hour? Yeah, and right. The, the, that that's I have to be almost pessimistic in order to get them to see how sometimes ridiculous those responses are. Because yeah. if a service manager or a hiring manager or an HR manager is interviewing you and, and their close is to try and get you with the $5 more an hour, and, oh, and we got a sign-on bonus, and oh, we got a guarantee, and oh, we got this. Well, why do they need a guarantee? Yeah. From one. Absolutely. Why do they need a guarantee? Absolutely. Because any place that has a guarantee, not all of them, not all of them, but so far any place that I've seen that has a guarantee means they're not reviewing their work mix nearly yeah. well enough or have a good enough dispatching program so that at the end of your week, you have an appropriate amount of CP work, an appropriate yeah. amount of, of warranty pay work so right. that you're still making good money, right. right? If you don't have those processes in place, oh, we'll just give them a guarantee, make sure they're okay. They'll, 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 we'll pay them 40 hours and we're still going to make a ton, ton of money on them, but we'll pay right. them the 40 hours. It, that means it, they don't care. Right? Yeah. It means they don't truly care about whether you succeed or not. They just need a live body turning wrenches in the bay. That is not right. a successful leader. That is not a successful business, in my view, for a technician. Right Now, like I said, most that I've reviewed thus far like that, not all. Sometimes yeah. it's just kind of – some of you technicians out there feel that you need that safety net of a guarantee. It's like I understand that. That's a confidence thing. We can work on that through coaching. Right. Yeah. Confidence is really, really important in what we do. We have to do things that are safe. We have to make sure that the car is safe because there's people in there, right? If we do something stupid, if we don't, if we omit a process or we get forgetful or whatever the case may be, it can happen and things can go sideways quickly. But that safety net can be there for your hours at the end of the day. But we're talking about people's lives. So we've got to be careful with that. Yeah. I digress. Um now, we've gone down the rabbit hole a bit about experience and some of the things that have changed and how you went from effectively billboarding through through newspapers and yeah. things at the beginning a bit like a cattle call. And now it's a lot more very tactical in what you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. You've gone from, say, three to five hours, it sounds like, to something that's probably like 30 or 40 hours over a period of a month to try and – Hey, get the right candidates, get the right, uh, get the right fit, find out about the, the business, the, the, the client that you're working for, trying to get those match things up. Mm -hmm. So let's move into a little bit more, uh, rec uh, more specific about the me mechanics here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's your one piece of advice after all of these years? So you've been doing this for 20 years. You've hired, helped hire a lot of technicians. What's your one piece of advice for a technician to help them be happier, healthier? Yeah. Well, you know, it is funny because I feel like we've been sitting here talking about it the entire time. It's know your value and treat this like a true profession. It's changed so much. And, and yeah, a lot of it is about the money. You're talking about somebody who's, who's going to be a 150, 200 K plus employee for this dealership. Think about that. Think about how far you've come in your career and know your value and, and do those things. And, and yeah, do, maybe you don't, you don't know what you don't know. So you, you, you seek out Josh Taylor, you, you find a mentor, you find someone who can, Hey, I, you know, I'm really good at this. I love this. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I want to take this very seriously. How can I kind of go to the next level? And I think it starts right there because we've seen that evolution in the past five years. I, I'm you, you want to talk about something that's changed in the past five years. We really couldn't even do technician recruiting. And I'm going back maybe seven years because the techs didn't have resumes. You know, they didn't know they, you know, and if they did, it was printed on a piece of paper. It certainly wasn't posted on a website or a PDF or anything like that. And it, it, it said mechanic 2005 to 2010. Right. And, and you talk about what goes into this career now as opposed to then in the, the value and the importance of this role within a dealership, know that and treat it that way. You know, everyone says, you know, dress for the career that you want. Well, we don't have to dress for the career we want, but mentally dress yourself up for the career that you want to be treated um, as, as that level of, of employee and as a, a massively important part of the, the service department and the dealership as a whole. Take yourself more seriously.
I appreciate that. That the knowing your value part has been is something that's been said in in several different ways over the last almost two years of of publishing, and you know get, getting it down to the nitty gritty here, understanding that five to ten years ago having uh, a lot of mechanics have a resume. I, I I could have seen that as a thing. Now the the challenge is, you know, when I work with a technician to try and get them someplace somehow, some way, and it's like, you know, send me your resume. Let me see what your resume is. And it's basically a, a Word document that has from to from to from to yeah, certification. Still not, we're still and not there. Absolutely, we're still, still not happens. quite there. The the challenge is understanding what each what each portion of that experience provides value to the job they're applying to, yeah. you know, understanding what they should put on the page, you know, and that eight, only 80%. So if you're applying for something, 80% of what you do is on that paper, right? 80% of your value is on that paper, not to, to, to uh, diminish an individual's value to something you can put on paper because only 80% of that goes on the paper. Right. The other 20% of that is your personality, your fit, your characters, your integrity, your morality, your your ethics, um, your drive, your passion, your ambition. All of those things are things that you can't physically put on a page, and it has sure. to come out in a face-to-face -face conversation with people to really understand whether you fit with the business that you're you're trying to interview with or – understanding whether you actually do fit with the business that you're in that you should probably stay and maybe just do some self-reflection and, and, and become better. Yeah. Because whilst you, I'm not implying that you're a bad human or a bad technician. I'm just implying that we can all improve. And maybe that little bit of improvement is all that is required for you to take the next step where you are. So you right. don't have to go through the stress of dealing with Joe or Steven or any of the other recruiters that we've had on the series. So, you know, I appreciate that knowing your value. I I really appreciate that. So, yeah. one little question before we we kick it here today, because I think the the most important thing that's come out of this thus far is getting technicians to understand what a top tier recruiter is and what they exemplify. So, like I've asked a couple in the past, as as some of you may re recall, you know, what should technicians ask recruiters? Yeah, or recruiting agencies to make sure they're working with one that is a top tier or high level recruiter for uh, on their behalf. Yeah, I, and you know, again, I feel like I love that question, and and I feel like we've kind of on the surface going through some of these things, at least as far as specifics. And I I wish we would get more of that from candidates, and we really don't. There's really not a whole lot of questions other than what are they paying, right? And there's usually, you know, maybe, you know, what do benefits look like and some specifics, but it's it's got to be stuff that gets at least the best you can. And look, we can represent our clients to the best of our ability, but no one's going to be able to really sit down and, and get a, a technician to feel what it's like to work at that shop other than the technicians and the service manager themselves. You got to go in and you got to see it, but you still have to dig with the recruiter and, and find out what your non-negotiables are, what you're in it for, what are your whys? You know, you're you're here with this recruiter. So even if you're not, if you're just dipping a toe in and you are a passive job seeker, like I said, there's a reason. There's something going on at your current employer that you don't feel 100% good about. You don't wake up and go to work with the same passion that you did that first year. So figure out what that is first, right? And, and you know, it could be money. Maybe you're unappreciated. But I think, you know, well, let's talk about money. I wanted to go back to what you were talking about in regard to to um, the flat rate number. We really don't even like to work in flat rate numbers that much anymore. I'll talk to our clients, and yes, it's part of the puzzle, and I want to know. But they'll get real excited. They'll throw, yeah, we're doing 50 an hour. And then I get to... Okay, what do you on average? What are your best techs turning? Oh yeah, I mean they're usually thirty-five to forty, right? And it gets real quiet and it comes down. So you need the entire picture and you need to to have, you know, get specific, get granular with us. I, I'm I'd love to have a tech take me on. Hey, I'm really interested in this. I really want to work for this place. I like what you're initially saying. I need a little more. I need to know. Okay, you mentioned there's health benefits. What, what's the buy-in for my family? Is my family covered at all? How much do we pay? Who's providing the, the health insurance? Is it Blue Cross Blue Shield? Uh, you know, get very, very specific. Have these questions in mind. If your resume is out there, if we can find you, it means at some point you were interested in making a change. 
So be prepared. Know again what your whys are and why you're out there and why you've put yourself out there, even if it's just half out there, and have those issues ready for the recruiter, whoever it is you may be talking about. And if you're talking directly with the dealership, that's great. But ask your questions too and make sure you're saying, here's what I need. Here's here's the information that I'm missing. Um, you know, what's what's the one thing about the culture at this dealership that separates them from the other dealers in the area so that it's not just about money. And again, those are all just words. You can't you can't really describe a culture. You can't put it on paper. You got to be there. You got to feel it. But, you know, even prep for that, like I said before, something me and Marco talk about a lot. Hey, will I be able to to come in and, and maybe, you know, talk to the other technicians, maybe do a trial run for a week? I'm really interested, but I'd, I'd like to see if this is the right fit for me interview knowing that you're in a, a kind of position of power right now knowing that there's there's more spots available than there are qualified technicians leverage that and say hey I'm I'm not making a move unless this is absolutely the right change for me and for my family and then do your own interview and ask your own questions instead of sitting there and let them ask all the questions when you go in for that interview um, and like you said, you know, kind of just level up. You're you're a, you're a big time professional now. You're a very important part of the profitability of a dealership. So so go in there and don't be a jerk about it. You know, you know, be kind. Show them that you're a, a a good human being. But at the same time, let them know that I have certain things that I need from you. And it's it's not just about money. It's about you know being treated you know equally and and like a valued member of the team. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's a lot of bit little tidbits in there for you guys to consume to really take to heart the next time you think about applying for something or going through a recruiter, where the case may be. There's lots of really good tidbits in there. And pick up Joe, the phone, like Josh said. Yeah, pick easier. up the phone. <laughs> pick up the phone. If you if you have questions, it doesn't matter who you call. Like call a recruiter, call me. It doesn't matter. If you have questions, ask. Because if you don't ask, nobody can help you. Absolutely. Doesn't matter who it is. If you don't ask for help, nobody can help you. So on that note, Joe, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate yeah, you giving you. The, uh, a little bit of your history, a little bit of your story, a little bit of your insights. I really appreciate it as part of this recruiter series. Yeah, this was great, man. I, I'd, I'd love to come back. Let me know anytime. I, this, this stuff just kind of pours out of me. Like I said, I love doing the round table. I love talking fixed ops. So anytime, I'm, I'm always here. Awesome. We'll do. Keep that, keep that going. So, folks, I think that's the end of another episode. That's all right, because we have another uh, recruiter series coming up next. So we'll have a look out for that. Remember, Tuesdays, I usually drop the, the hint as to who it's going to be and with a little clip on LinkedIn. Check that out. And remember that um, I really appreciate all of you, all of you that have bought merch. I, I It started to take off. I really appreciate all of you. My mama is very proud. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for checking out the Wrench Nerds merch on the store. If you don't know what it is, check it out. It's in the link below, both on Spotify and on YouTube. Make sure you check that out. Appreciate you all. Quote to end the show, as we always do. Quote is an interesting quote because um, it really resonates me, with me personally. Find something you're passionate about and keep tremendously interested in it. Julia Child. Folks, remember, negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away.